several months ago, I think it was in January, or, or I put out a, a thing about on Facebook about um, I was going to do this book tour. And I said, you know, I waive my fee. Who wants to do this? And within 10, se I don't know, 10 seconds, Fan came and said, um, th we are going to be doing this with you, and here's the reasons why. And I, said, and, we and I talked to them, and Lonnie said to me, I think we can do this on a Friday night. And I said, why would anybody want to come on a Friday night and hang out with me? This is like, is this date night material? And she said, we're, I think so. We're going to try and do it on a Friday night. It is extraordinary to me that you all are here on a Friday night. So I'm actually, as the teacher that I am, um, going to mandate for your homework that after you come hang out with me, that if you came here with some other people, a spouse, a partner, your friends, that afterwards, would you go out and like have a good time, right? Like, I mean, I'm hoping you're gonna have a good time with me, but go and have like a good, you know, like have a good time, relax and have a good time after the presentation with me. So what I wanna do it was I want to bring you into the world of being a seventh grade boy. So I would like for you to raise your hand if you have one currently residing in your home. Okay. Now, I do too, by the way. Um, my seventh grade boy is six feet one and 175 pounds, and yes, it's a serious problem. Um, but if you don't have a seventh grade boy, I want the men in the room to really remember what it was like to be in seventh grade. I really want you to just sit here. Women, I really, I mean, you are off right, right, right now. Men, I want you to remember what it was like to be in seventh grade. And now I'm gonna tell you this story. So imagine that your seventh grade son was invited to a swim party. And he was invited to a swim party by his friends. And about two, I don't know, it's like a birthday party, and about two weeks before the party, he casually asks you to buy him a swim shirt. He does not say why he needs it. He doesn't say that it's an important thing that you need to do right away. He doesn't do anything but casually say he would like a swim shirt. So you file it away on t in the part of your brain that says, the next time I happen to go to a place where I can get a swim shirt, I will be buying this swim shirt. And then the day of the party arrives. It's the time to go. It's time to go. You look for your son. He isn't ready. You can't find him. So you call him and you say, in your normal tone of voice, John, John, time to go to the party. There's no answer. So then you do your like 10 or 15 percent. I'm beginning to get aggravated, but I'm not really sure if I should be aggravated voice. So then you say, John, time to go to the party you don't get an answer. You find your son molded into the couch on his Xbox or on his whatever game he likes to play and he is playing a pretty violent video game or something that is like what you think is too much, inappropriate, don't like it, maybe he's playing it anyway, but he is absolutely glued to this thing. And you are annoyed because clearly he is violating the rules of screen time in your house, he is not listening, and he has no bathing suit, there is no towel, he is not ready. So you are totally understandably irritated. So you say, it is time to go to this party. And he won't stop. So then you turn off the television and he gets really, really, or the screen, and he gets really sullen. And you're thinking to yourself, are you kidding me with this? Well, you go to the party, you get him in the car, and he's not, he is just irritated and you are irritated too, and you are thinking, my child is addicted to video games, he is not recognizing my screen time rules, I am extremely frustrated, we have been going over this and over this and over this, this is totally frustrating. You drop him off at the party. Three hours later, you pick him up, and you are absolutely determined to start fresh. And when he gets in the car, you ask a very understandable, normal question. How was the party? And he says, fine. And you say, who was there? And he says, like, you are really stupid. It's so, like some people from school. <laughs> and then you are back to being incredibly irritated. <laughs> and you think you are raising an ungrateful child, maybe a brat is the word that comes into your mind, and then you take him home, 
and he goes right back upstairs to the screen and starts playing that game and he chooses the most violent game that he can possibly choose. And your reaction to this is, my child is addicted to video games. He is going to turn into a violent freak. I do not like this. I didn't like this game anyway. I never agreed to this game anyway. How did this happen? I'm so annoyed. I'm so angry. I feel so frustrated. And he's just sitting there blasting somebody away. Well, here's what's happening that might be almost right in front of your eyes, but you're not seeing it. While he was at the swim party, his very good friends, his group, teased him. And one of them in particular is really good at it. And they're really good, he's really good at it because he calls him boob boy or moobs, like man boobs. And when your son got out of the, out of the pool, this kid convinced another kid to take a picture of your child and then send it to everybody else. And he especially sent it to a girl that your son has a big crush on. And while this was happening, his other friends, one of them swam away and one of them laughed. One of them tried to sort of help him, but not, it was like sort of too late, wasn't really helping. And he is furious. And he is furious for the following reasons. He is furious because he thinks there is nothing that he can do to stop this kid. And he's imagining like horribly, like he hopes he breaks his leg the next time that he like, you know, just falls on the street. He's also incredibly embarrassed about being called boob boy and having moobs. But he has no language to be able to talk about it because he's a boy. And he's really mad or really frustrated or really sort of torn up inside because he doesn't know how to talk to you about it because he's really worries that if he talks to you about this, you are going to do something. <laughs> and that is terrible, terrible. Now you don't know any of this and it's right in front of you. And so we misread the things that boys do all the time. And I'm going to explain to you this evening why I think we do and how we can do it better. Because a couple of years ago, I've been working with kids for a long time, almost 20 years. And it became very clear to me that boys were consistently asking me for advice about their parents, about their coaches, about school, about girls, about friends. They were sharing with me their problems and I sometimes felt like I wasn't answering them in the way they needed to. And I felt like, of course, they deserve more. They needed my best attention and my best work. So two years ago, I stopped talking to boys and I started listening. And what I did was I went around the country and I gave uh, several schools and I said, schools, I would like to work with a group of boys, not your perfect boys, the ones that you trot out when you want to introduce somebody to the school. I don't want those boys. I mean, I'll take, I'll take them, but I want everybody else. I want the boys at the swim party. I want the tormentor. I want the kid who laughed. I want the kid who swam away. I want the one who is being tormented. I want all the different kinds of kids. And several schools around the country, from boarding schools in the Northeast to all boys schools in the South, to New Orleans schools, charter schools, uh, working class in, in, in Massachusetts, to, to Southern California, all over came forward, Louisville, Kentucky, and said, we want to do this with you. And so for every quarter, I started working with and seeing boys, and then I started emailing with them pretty much or texting with them every day. And they would get absolutely no reward. This was the deal. I said to them, you will get no reward, except if you do a good job, I will write you a college recommendation. And there were a couple of them that were like, oh, I got to sign up for that. I got to sign up for that. Some of them said to me, my mother will get off my case if I sign up for this. I'm definitely signing up for this. So they signed up. But then I started going to doing the presentations I do with high school kids and middle school kids. And at the end of the presentations, I would say, I'm writing this book for boys. And I'm writing a book for parents and for people who care about boys. If you want to help me with this, then help me. I need to know what to say. I need to know not what to say. I need, I need information from you. And I had boys who would come up to me after the presentations and say, I want to help. But I also had boys who found out how to reach me and would tweet me and tell me secretly. 
In fact, there were three boys at a school in California, three alpha male soccer football playing guys that were friends with each other that all contacted me privately and never told each other that they were working with me and did not find out until about two months ago. So the boys and I worked together to create two books. And this is not really about books. This is really about trying to change the conversation that we have about boys and how we talk to boys and how boys talk to us. So this is my, I'm here to really change or ask to, and requesting of you all that we need to maybe look at the ways in which boy, we're talking to boys differently and see it from their point of view. So we have Masterminds, this book for parents and for people who care about boys. But we also have a book called The Guide, and excuse my language, it's for high school boys. And the guide is really called The Guide, Managing Douchebags, Recruiting Wingmen, and Attracting Who You Want. And it is everything that you want as a high school guy. We tried to give, like, okay, what happens when a girl makes your life miserable? What happens when your friends turn on you? What happens when you have lied to your parents and they're about to catch you? What happens if you get pulled over by a police officer? What happens if you get caught sneaking out? What, ha what does racism look like amongst good friends of boys? Because that's a really big issue that gets skated over all the time. So what does the world look like to boys, for boys? So these two projects turned into truly one of, if not the most rewarding work experiences I have ever had. So what do we do? What did I learn and what can I share with you? Let's go back to the swim party. I have worked on girls' issues for a long time. Some of you might have read some of the stuff that I write. What is absolutely clear to me is that girls have a language to talk about the toxicity of the culture that they are living in. So they are getting really problematic messages about how sexual they should be, how they should present themselves, how they should be valued. But within that, there are people and there is a structure in the culture to counteract the toxic messages that girls are getting. We do not have that for boys. The attempts that have been made to be able to reach boys often are not reflective of what boys, and frankly, speaking as a woman, a lot of people feel comfortable talk as, you know, talking about their innermost feelings. I don't think anybody really wants to sit down in a circle with people that you may or may not know or may, or may not like with an adult who looks at you expectantly and says, tell me all of your deepest, darkest secrets. So we have to be able to communicate with boys and give them a language that works for them and acknowledges their experiences. So one of the things that were really important to me tonight is that when we talk about boys, and I have heard this so often as a mother of two boys and as the expert on girls, which I'm not, by the way. I am always learning. Girls are always schooling me. Um, boys are easy. Girls are really hard. Boys are simple. They fight, they punch, and it's over. I believe that boys' lives are much more complicated and that we do them a disservice and we do all of us a disservice by not recognizing their right to have emotionally complex lives, that we do ourselves and them a disservice by not recognizing the importance that they place on their friendships and how deeply they feel about their friendships and what happens when those friendships run off the rails, about their experiences like your uh, superintendent talked about, about the uh, you know, experiences with girls and certainly their experiences with coaches and parents. These are deep experiences that the boys feel and they need to be honored and recognized so we can address them effectively. Otherwise, boys absolutely disengage from us, but they don't want to. One of the things that I realized through this process is that as cynical as the boys are, and they are pretty cynical, if we meet them halfway in very concrete ways that I will show you tonight, my experience is the boys will move forward and join us. And that is to all of our benefit not just a particular individual boy, but to the emotional health and safety of our communities. So 
let's go to what makes, what makes a boy or anybody feel good. Like, what's our, what's our foundation? So I'm going to, here we go, turn on my thing. So what is happiness? Now, it's sort of weird to talk about happiness in school because it's like a fuzzy, soft term. But I actually really think about happiness in these ways that I think are pretty content-filled. One is you have meaning beyond yourself. The other is you have a hope of success, not a guarantee, a hope. You have social connection, and you have satisfying work. Now, the reason I love my job, now my job can be really, really hard. I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall a lot. But the, my work, actually, and what I love about my work is it satisfies these four things. And if you think about why would these boys have worked with me for two years, day in and day out, texting me every day, emailing me every day, it's because I believe it was meeting these four criteria. But this is the case for everybody. Girls are exactly the same way. Now, within this, within the happiness goal, it is absolutely natural to have conflict with other people. So one of my happiness goals is social connection. You have deep social connection with people. But you are a human being, you are messy, people are messy, and there are things that are absolutely inevitable. One of them is conflict. You will get into conflict with other people. The other, and this is, my, sort of, this is one of my foundations, is that one of our guiding posts is that we treat others and ourselves with dignity, meaning worth, that you have inherent worth, that nobody, for no reason, no matter how angry they are at you, no matter how irritating you are, no matter what, that you have inherent dignity, that you are worthwhile, that you speak, your voice matters. But the other part of the world is, because we live in the real world, is that there is consistently experiences where people are abusing power or silencing another person's right to speak. And all boys are going to have this experience. No matter how good of a school, no matter how wonderful your communities are, you are never going to be able to stop your child from experiencing conflict or an abuse of power. They will experience it. They will witness it. They might perpetrate it. They might not be aware of it. But this is inevitable. So I believe it is our goal, again now for both boys and girls, is to teach them to be socially competent and to do it with a bedrock principle that dignity is not negotiable for themselves or others. That is, as a teacher and a, as a mother, are my guiding posts at all times. So within this conflict, within these conflicts and abuses of power, let's go back to the swim party. So boys, some boys, have an inner circle. And in that inner circle is about five boys. It could change a little bit, but five boys, maybe up to six or seven, maybe three. But what the boys reported to me is that within these inner circles, when, wherever they were in the social hierarchy of the school, that these roles that I'm about to show you in some way are alive. Now, I'm going to show you these roles, but I also, as a preface, I'm going to say that, that these are not labels that are forever stuck onto your child. This is a way to, have, to start a conversation to understand people's motivations, to be able to predict how a kid is going to be able to act, and to be able, as the adult in their lives, to be able to take efficacy, self-agency, and become competent, and again, living and treating yourself and others with dignity. So the boys and I had a lot of debates. I have to tell you, there was a lot of debating. There was a lot of arguing. I was basically in arguments with boys for about two years. That's what it felt like. And some of the time, the stories were also so funny that I, you can imagine how often I laughed and would say things like, I cannot believe, I cannot believe you thought X was a good idea. I can still read them in these books and laugh, even though I've read them about a hundred times. So here are the roles that the boys identified in their groups. A mastermind, thank you. A mastermind directs the group's movements so that I want you to think about that whoever speaks 
right? Or excuse me, whoever, whoever eats. So whoever, you know, I want you to think of like middle school eating, right? And they're all sitting in a group, a bunch of eighth grade boys, and whoever gets up is your mastermind. Does that make sense? So think about the swim party. Your son, who, the, who is being called Moo Boy, is eating lunch with his friends. And whoever gets up first is the mastermind. Next, gives ultimate approval to his friends. So this is, the issue could be sneaker choice, like what the boys like for sneakers. Or it could be music. Or it could be what video game they're playing. Or it could be what sandwich shop they're going to go to. Or what girls are hot. Or anything. Who, they, who you should vote for for president. Anything. The boy directs the ultimate, he gives ultimate approval. Now within those little ultimate approval moments are actually moments of conflict. So if a boy in the group says, oh, well, I'd like to go to Subway, and he's like, Ugh, Subway? The boys aren't going to Subway. If they're playing Call of Duty, and one of the kids wants to play zombies, and the other kid's like, Ugh, and the mastermind's like, Ugh, we're not, no, we're playing Modern Warfare 2, no, no, we're not playing zombies, that's stupid. That's a conflict, that's an, that is a little tiny moment where the boys are jockeying for power, except the same person always wins. Now what's really tricky is that it can be, as an educator, that you're not really sure how intelligent he is until his power is threatened. Now, I know there's a lot of teachers in this room, right? I have a feeling there's like some teacher, I got the teacher vibe in this room. All right, so, and I got some administrator vibes too. So here's, I will talk to you now as an educator and as somebody who has worked with kids who have abused power, from hazing to sexual assault to all sorts of things, terrible, really tricky things. When we, I find out that this kid is beyond, be, like sort of behind all of this or the main motivator, my frequent response has been, until I wrote this book, how did that happen? That kid's not smart enough to do that. And then I realized that it was actually part of his genius. His genius is to actually come across as not as smart as he is. So let me give you an example. I was working in, uh, with a school that is in a very, very nice part of this country, lovely families, you know, all that stuff, right? And they had a young man who was having a very hard time being a decent human being. It was a serious struggle. And his parents were having a very hard time holding him accountable, as in they were not holding him accountable. And every time he would do something completely crazy and horrible, they would run into the school and yip at the school, and the school would back down. So this child was hazing, physically hazing a freshman boy, and he was sexually harassing slash assaulting one, some of the girls in the school. Eventually, the behavior got so egregious that they suspended the child for two days. What the child did in response, and remember, I didn't think this child was that bright, was he, would go, he went down to the neighborhood restaurant, and he held court at the restaurant. And all of the kids knew that he was, going, he was down there. And his inner circle group of friends went down to that place to sort of play homage, homage to him and to you know, make him feel better. And one of the things that they did to protest the injustice of the school suspending him was they wore black armbands to school in protest of this horrible thing that had happened to this child. The other thing that happened is that he was so manipulative about the situation that he made the girl that was seen as the major target of the sexual harassment feel so guilty that he was having this horrible punishment happen to him that she baked him cookies. Now when that happens, the school loses all credibility to the student body. So who won that power struggle? The school did not win that power struggle. The student, the student did. It was absolutely clear. Now, if you had asked me before this happened if this kid was smart enough to be able to do this, I probably would have said, I would know I, I did. I was like, no way. So I want you to think about that. Now, at the same time, as I just said all this negative stuff, there are some positives to the mastermind. He can be incredibly charismatic. He's great to have on your side. He can defend you against other people. He can be super fun to be around. So there's also really positive things about this. All right, the associate. The associate gathers information. 
And the other thing that he does is he, you know, he, there's, imagine the boys sitting on the couch, right? They're sitting on the, they're sitting on the couch and they're sort of molded into your couch. Can you picture this? Boys molded into your couch. And what, the associate sits there with the phone and he gathers information from other people. And as, the, as they get older, this becomes more and more likely to be girls as well, obviously. And he tells what is going on. And then he becomes the social point person. So, and what happens with that is that then he tells the mastermind and then the mastermind tells him what they're gonna do. So the associate gathers information, the mastermind decides the movement of the group. Now the associate also can be a great kid. It is not always terrible. And he can have an ability to stand up to the mastermind, but it's really pretty hard for him. I mean, he can, he's like your best shot, but it's hard. So the bouncer is a kid who can't read people's motivations, has a really, really hard time doing that. He often struggles academically, and he can take the fall for the boys, the mastermind and the associate. And what happens is, is that those boys use the concept of loyalty with the bouncer to convince him that that's what he should be doing because friends are loyal, which means friends take the fall. One of the things that we've done a lot in masterminds and with the guide is to be very clear about what loyalty truly is. And it is not being manipulated by your friends. The fly. The fly is something that I think can make parents uncomfortable, but the boys were adamant that we included this. He builds his friendships by bragging or buying. And if his parents have the means to do that, and I was listening to, you know, the, the, um, to the title from the you know, well-meaning and well-intentioned parents doing crazy things, that's what I heard. I can't quite remember, but this is a really good example. If you, have a, if you have a son and you're really worried about his friendships or you think he's not making friends in the way that you want, a well-intentioned parent who has the means can do some pretty crazy things. So for example, you know, oh, let's do something nice for you. So let's go get tickets for a super expensive athletic event and you can invite three or four of your friends. When parents do things like that and you've got this kid, the other children, all they're doing really is using your child to go to this really cool game. It feels horrible, but that's what the boys are reporting. And so that means that the boy oftentimes hovers outside the group and looks for opportunities to be useful to them or worth, worthwhile and valuable to them, but the other boys do not have any guilt excluding him. So what's very important with both boys and girls that I think gets lost a lot is that when we think about kids who are mean, we often do not think that the kids who are mean feel justified in what they're doing. They don't think that they're doing anything wrong. And in my experience, a lot of these kids feel like they are justified or they're not really doing anything wrong because the kid was so obnoxious to them or so irritating. And in this case, with the fly, it's like this kid won't leave us alone. That is why kids who are, who are tormentors or who we perceive sometimes, not always, certainly, but sometimes we perceive them to be bullies, is, be, is the issue that they believe that they are being clear with kids like the fly, but the kid's not listening. And so they are forced, this is what kids will say, they are forced to be mean to that child. So this is a way of, even if it's uncomfortable, of understanding the behavior and the patterns of what you might be seeing. The entertainer. This is a really easy kid to like. Obnoxious but not mean. Let's go back to the swim party. He's the kid that when, you're, when your son had that horrible thing happen, that he tried to make a joke and sort of smooth it over. He's good at making people feel comfortable and he has a hard time turning himself off. So this kid can be super frustrating when you're, you know, like, can you please, please stop running your mouth? Like, I have kids like this as, as students. I actually sometimes have one of them as, as my own child, and it's exhausting, right? It is absolutely exhausting. But he can be, and often is, the social glue for the boys. He makes things better and more comfortable. When there's an overt expression or abuse of power, he makes it more comfortable. The punching bag. You only got two more, and please don't be freaking out about this. 
If anybody's like, oh my gosh, what is my kid? What is my kid? What is my kid? Please do not do this. You're doing this. Please do not do this. I said in the beginning that I didn't want you labeling people. And I, you know what, I bet if you're doing that to your kid, you're definitely doing it to the other kids you know. <laughs> okay, so remember these are roles and patterns. Roles and patterns, okay. The punching bag is the easy target amongst the boys. So one of the things that the boys often say, just like when siblings say about their brothers and sisters, nobody can say anything bad about my brother or sister, but I get to do whatever I want to them. So that's the same attitude that the boys have towards the punching bag. The, so it's one of the things that happens, which is extraordinary, is to listen to the boys talk about their justification that they have the right to treat him badly. Because they will say things like, we love him, he's our brother. Yes, we humiliate him constantly, but he's our brother, we love him, and if anybody is gonna do that to him but us, we're gonna go after them. So that's the positive. I know that might seem really odd to you, but the positive is the boys feel loyal that they do not allow anybody else to treat him badly. And if you in any way find out that this is going on with your son, one of the things that can be really frustrating is that you feel like, you know, or say something like, why are you letting these boys treat you like this? I want you to remember my social connection and how important the friendships are to the boys. Because it's not all bad. These relationships can be wonderful. It can be so fun to sit with them and mold yourself into the couch with these guys. It's just that there are some times and moments that can be really uncomfortable. And so for this boy, this is not about like, oh, I'm desperate for friends. It's, these are my boys. These are my close friendships. They're meaningful to me. Yes, I have this stuff in them, these friendships that I don't like but I'm gonna, I'll take it. My last role is the conscience. Now, lots of parents are like, mm, that is my child. He <laughs> likes rules, rule, he is worried about the rules and consequences, like he knows he's a good boy. What I have found, really, the last two years have been quite surprising in many, many ways, is that the conscience actually is a very complicated role. So the conscience really does worry about rules and consequences, and so what that means is when the rest of the group is going to do something stupid or risky or something that you will not approve of, then the, con then the conscience is going to be the person who comes forward and maybe says something like, is this really a good idea? And so for that reason, as the boys get older, the inner circle will sometimes isolate him or leave him out, excuse me, to, to exclude him, because it's like having a chaperone. So when you're about to do something stupid, it's sort of a bummer to have somebody say, um, is this a good idea? You don't want that. That is, not, that is not fun. You don't want any questioning of why what you're about to do is a bad idea or what the possible consequences could be. So you exclude him, but not all the time because the group or the boys within it are not at all above using him as a screen to you. Because this boy oftentimes feels that yes, rules and consequences are important, but so is loyalty to his friends. So here's what I learned, boy, and boys are open about this with the conscience standing right there. I had a, one of the boys, one of the editors was named Aaron, awesome kid, loved this kid. Went and did a thing with me last week at the Library of Congress, an upstanding gentleman who was so funny in talking to me about, oh yeah, if I want to go somewhere and my mom, I think my mom's not going to let me or my dad's not going to let me, all I need to say is that the conscience is coming with me and then they'll let me go. So I never tell them of oh, the other boys that I'm going with, why would I do that? Then my mother or father would say, over my dead body, are you going with that other kid? But if I say that Brian is going with me, sure, no problem. And I know that my mother could even call Brian and say, like, are you doing this? And Brian's gonna lie for me. So he is often a screen between the adult world and kid world. And think about just one other way of looking at the conscience. Say they're in high school, there's a party, shocking. And the music, the police are called. The mastermind is either gonna handle it with the police officer because, oh, you know, yes, sir, because he can mimic sort of feeling bad and like, yes, sir, I got it under control and all that kind of stuff. He can mimic it. 
But who better than the conscience who truly feels terrible about what's happening than to send him out to have the conversation with the police officer? Yes, sir, we'll totally take, put the music down. I know we've been really disrespectful. I know, I know. The police officer is looking at somebody and dealing with somebody who feels terrible. So the police officer understandably feels like this is going to stop. And the other kids are like, sweet, because my, the conscience went and took care of it. He was a great screen. This should all be quite clear to you that boys are complicated. They are complex. They have complex relationships and power dynamics, and they know it. And here's the strangest part about the whole thing. They love to talk about it. I, I know this sounds really odd, but I got to tell you that the boys often wanted to talk about this so much that I would have to leave them and say, like, I cannot talk about this anymore with you. I got to go on a plane. I got to go to another class. I got to, no, 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 we got to figure this out more. There's more iterations of this. There's more stuff going on. So these roles are complicated, complex. Somebody could be one thing at home, another at school, could be a little bit of a conscience, a little bit of a punching bag. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about the experiences that you've had as a parent or as an educator, that this will give you some language to start with. Now, as I said, problems are inevitable. Conflicts are inevitable. What are we going to do with the swim party? Your kid comes home and maybe you figure out or you find out, oh my gosh, this horrible thing happened. Well, what do you do? How do we talk to our boys? Because boys are very tricky and hard to talk to because you say to them, how was your day? And they say, fine. What'd you do at school today? Nothing. So how do you get past that? I'm going to give you my best information about this from the boys. Number one, I want you to think about that the foundation of getting your son to talk to you about the swim party or talk to you about something that's happening in the playground if you have a younger kid or talking to you about a horrible thing that happened to him, maybe on an athletic team, maybe on the debate team, maybe on, at, at a party as he gets older, that it starts with the foundation. I swear to you, this is what the boys are telling me. I swear to you. What they're saying is, you want me to talk to you? Stop interrogating me in the car. Now, I want to apologize on behalf of experts all over the country that we have been saying to you for a very long time, when you get your kid in the car, ask them all sorts of questions, which, by the way, means that your child is trapped, which is exactly the way that your child feels. So here's what I would suggest. I mean, here's what happens. This is what the boys are reporting. They're, they've been walking around school all day or dealing with this stuff all day, and basically all boys and girls have to walk around with some kind of armor that they walk around school with. It could, again, be a wonderful school with wonderful teachers, and kids are still going to walk down the hallway with a particular kind of armor so they can get through the day. So when they get into your car at the end of that day, if you have an emotionally healthy relationship with your child, they want to relax. They want to decompress. So when you ask them these well-meaning questions, how was your day? What happened? What were the five most important things that happened to you today? <laughs> Which is what one of the boys reported. My, one of my favorite quotes in the book is, every day, every day. I get into the car and my mother says, tell me the five most important things that happened to you today. And he just looked at me and he was like, I mean, I have to tell you, I'll just be straight. He was like, my mother is Puerto Rican and Jewish. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> and then he said, she exhausts me. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to think about. And if we think about it from the boy's perspective, it makes so much sense. And this is what they said to me. Imagine if my mother or father came home from a very difficult day at work. And the first thing that I did when I saw them was, so, hi, how was work today? Did you get all of your emails done? Did you do that? Did you have that meeting? Did you confront the person who's been undermining you the entire time? <laughs> did you talk about it with them? How did it go? Well, really? You don't think it went really well? It looks like you don't really didn't do it really well. So maybe you need to do it better. Should we talk about this? Can you understand from the boy's, boy's point of view, they're like, please stop, please stop. So they literally, when this came up, 
It was one of the first things that came up when I was doing the research. And I started doing this around the country and asking about this. It was literally, it was like we were in church. The boys, New Orleans, the boarding schools, Southern California, would get up out of their seats and start doing like, hallelujah. I swear to you, two of the boys did that. And slapping their hands and being, please, please tell my parents to stop doing this. And I promised them that when I had the opportunity that I would share with you how difficult that is. Now, also to be fair, because I, my job was also to say, excuse me, um, parents are people. We have a right to know what's going on in your life. So how do they want to be talked to? So this is my best suggestion. My best suggestion is when they get in the car, you say, hey, what's up? With no, like, just like, hey, what's up? Not like, hey, what's up? right? Hey, what's up? Get into the car, be chill, be relaxed, be silent, allow there to be some silence in the, in the space of the car. We have no silence anymore in our lives at all. Just try it for a minute. I'm not talking about the whole ride home. I'm talking about try one minute of silence. Just really, one minute. If they want to listen to music, they can listen to music. You get to veto if you don't like or you think it's inappropriate. Whatever music that they you know, are listening to, you can reach a compromise about that. But listen to music. Do not ask them anything about their day besides like just be with them. Just be with them. Now, what's the other thing that you can do? The other thing in order to reach them is that uh, and this is working, this has now worked for me as a parent. So the things that the boys told me helped me a lot with my own children is you know your kid, you know the schedule of your kid, try and figure out what works for you and your child. For me, at about 9.30 or 10 at night with my two boys, when they're in bed, you know, they've been reading, or lights, but lights are out, go sit at the foot of their bed and say, hey, is there anything important going on? It's your own words. Anything, you know, like, just want to check in with you. You good? Do not expect a hallmark moment. Just, you know, if the guy says, yeah, I'm good, he's like, what is going on with my parent? Why are they doing this? Just say, like, I just want to know. I just, like, you know, it's quiet. I just want to ask you. I just, I just want to know. I just want to check in. That's it. Now, the reason why being dark, it's dark is good, is because if your children are like my children, they are hyper-reactive to any facial expression that you have. So, I mean, on, with me, if I raise my eyebrow or if I sigh, like a tiny, tiny bit, my older child, both of my children, accuse me of completely freaking out on them. <laughs> and, here, and, and if they were right here, they swear to you, they'd be like, and she's doing it, she's totally doing it. I wanna be, but here's the thing, I was really arguing with them about, I was like, that's not true, that's not true, I'm not really raising, it doesn't mean that much when I sigh. They're right, when I sigh, I'm really irritated. When I raise my eyebrow, I'm really irritated. They're right. So if it's dark, because I can't control my face all the time, and when it's dark, you can listen better, and it's quieter. Second thing I would ask you to do, and this is all about, crazy enough, how do you get your kid at the swim party to tell you that he's being called boob boy? It really starts in the car like that, talking to him at bed, at the bed, and when he, at the foot of the bed. Or with my kids, what I do is my very, very tall child plays basketball, not shocking, and um, I pass him the ball. When, it, you know, when he's practicing his shot you know, in our driveway, I, I pass him the ball and I, say, and I ask him questions. Not five questions, one question. And we start talking and we have great, that's like the really good question, really good conversations that we have in that moment. Here's another strategy for you. Boys are really good, just like girls, at pushing every single button that we have when we are mad at them. So they know exactly what to say that stops us, distracts us, confuses us. If you have a negotiator, like the kid that you're like, oh, he's going to be a great lawyer one day, but now you're, he's exhausting you. If you have that kid, that's especially for you. Before you get into the argument or before you are about to have this conversation and you feel that it's the 57th time that you've had this conversation, uh, this is what I do. I pick the three things that I feel I have to say in my little, my, little, my little space of time, which is about three minutes long. So I give myself three minutes. 
I give myself three points. No matter what my child says to me to distract me, irritate me, and confuse me, I'm going to say these three points. And I am not going to repeat myself. If I repeat myself, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, I am not going to repeat myself. And if you want to do it as a, like a little tag for you, because when I repeat myself, you don't listen to a word I say. <laughs> so no repeating yourself, say it in three minutes and have three points. The other thing I would tell you as well, and this again is about how you get your kid to talk to you, because this is about being an authority figure in an ethical way that can be taken seriously by your child without being dominating and controlling is have you noticed that when you're about to, you need them to get something done, but it's like right before you have to leave to go somewhere? I don't know if you've ever had this experience. You have to go somewhere and all this, they have not done with all these things that they need to do and you are just fit to be tied. So they're arguing with you and you've got somewhere to go. So I have found it extremely effective, like so effective that I sort of, I actually turned around and was like, yes, was, <laughs> I said to, my kid was being just, just relentless, and I said to him, all right, I want to have this argument with you, but I need to schedule it for later today. So, because right now I have things to do, but I definitely want to have this argument with you. So at eight o'clock tonight, that's when I think I'll be ready for this argument. Do you think you will be ready for this argument at eight o'clock? Good, eight o'clock, we will reconvene, we will have this argument. I look forward to it. Now we're getting into the car. I, that was like awesome. There are, I mean, it was, it's like you win a prize when something actually works. Like you're like, yes, this is awesome. Get, he, has stopped, he has stopped talking for like two seconds. Okay. Now I know this might seem far afield to get you to a place where your kid is having a problem and they talk to you. So here, but those are, the build, those are some of the building blocks that I talk about in, the, in, this, in these books about how to get you to a place where your son, when he goes through a problem, will talk to you. And these are actually very similar dynamics, in some ways, to girls. So when your son comes to you with a problem, both boys and girls are gonna probably say, the ex is, you know, these kids are bothering me. So at the swim party, well, the kids sort of bothered me. So what I would ask you to say in response is, I'm not really sure what that looks like, so can you do me a favor and de describe it to me so I understand it better? Or can you just be a little bit more specific so I understand it better? Then what I would ask you to do, and again, these are suggestions, you know, take them and put them with what you've got, is you say something like, I'm really sorry this happened to you, thank you for telling me, and together we are gonna work on this. If your child says to you, I'm going to tell you this, but you have to promise not to do anything. What I would strongly suggest that you say, and again, this is absolutely appropriate for boys and girls, is I would love to make this promise, but I can't because I don't want to make a promise I might not keep, right? Like that is really important to me is to keep my promises. But what I can do is I can promise you that if you tell me something that I've got to get somebody else involved, you will be part of the process. You will be part. You will never be blindsided. You will never be shocked that this person is a part of the process. What I have found time and time and time again is that young people absolutely will allow us to be the adults that they want us to be if we recognize that this is their life, if we recognize that they have a right to have a say in these things because, and I would say this to your kid, because of course I don't want to surprise you, of course I want you involved, because you have to deal with the consequences of what we go through, not me. So of course you should be involved and will be involved every step of the way. Now, the other thing is, what if you have a bystander? What if you have a kid who admits to you that he is seeing things or you see him see things? I would say to this child, if he talks to you, or if you see it, watching these things is really hard. If you do something about this, or if you speak out about it, I will truly, truly respect that you did. I know this is incredibly difficult, but loyalty, especially when these things are happening with a good friend, loyalty is not allowing him to do anything that he wants. Loyalty is speaking out when he is doing something you disagree with. Or as the boys have said to me, being a friend is often about saying things that you don't necessarily want to hear. 
And that is the true definition of friendship. Now, men in the room, if you can talk to your boys in a way where you are saying, Sometimes it is overwhelming. We all get into situations that are overwhelming. Here's an experience I had that was overwhelming, and you can be specific about that, that's age appropriate. But asking for help and thinking through who the best person is, is not weak. It is a sign of, it is a capacity, it is a skill, it is a strength. If you transform that moment for a boy from asking for help is weak, to asking for help and doing it intelligently is a strength and a capacity, you literally have transformed that boy's life. That is what our men need to be saying to our boys. Now women, we can do this too. I do it with my boys. But let us honor the relationship that men have with their sons and men can have with boys, where boys can see a way to be confident, strong men and that they believe that social connection, and they see it in the men in their lives, that social connection is meaningful, it is messy, but it is valued by the men in their lives, and they will stand up for it and value it in the boys' lives as well. Now, what if you get a bad news bomb, right? When you get a phone call or an email, especially ones with like all capitals, or some strategic use of capitals, which please do, not use, please do not be sending these emails with all capitals, it really, it's just, please don't, is if you get that, or if you get somebody, and I've had this happen to me, where like I was on a field once and I had a mother who I didn't know come at me, and I knew, you know, like you wanna run, right? The mom was coming at me, I didn't even know, I had no clue why she was mad at me, I was sort of hoping that other people were around me and she was gonna go for them, I was wrong. <laughs> Um, she was furious at my younger child because she said that when she calmed down that my son was throwing rocks in the direction of her child. And I wouldn't put it past my kid to be throwing, the, throwing those rocks, you know, intentionally. I wouldn't. But she was coming at me so hard and so angry that I, when I saw her, my heart like, was like up in my throat and I couldn't breathe. So if you've got a parent who's coming at you a million miles an hour and they're incredibly angry, Here's what, I, it's really normal and understandable and common to react like, <gasps> right? And you can't breathe, you get defensive, you can't process what you're saying, you, what they're saying, and it doesn't go well. When you have this happen to you, I would suggest that if the person is acting like this, you say something like, when, the way you're talking to me, the way you just came up to me, I can't hear you because, I, this is literally what I have said three times in my life, because my heart is beating so hard that I cannot hear you but I really want to hear what you're saying, so can you please tell me again in a way that I can hear? Now, I would be careful, men in the room, you might know this already, that when you tell a woman to calm down, <laughs> that is usually a way to get her um, really not calm. So I would avoid the can you please calm down kind of thing, because it comes across as patronizing. And the reason it comes across as patronizing is because lots of women have grown up we have many of us have had the experience of people telling us to calm down when we are vocalizing a problem that we have. So there's a legitimacy to this. So this is a complicated dynamic between the boys and the girls and the parents. So just say, I'm having a really hard time hearing you. I want to hear it. So can you please tell me, can you please do this again? Maybe a little slower. Try slower instead of calm. And that's easier. I want you to remember that when you get a bad news bomb, the re reaction is to doubt your sanity, to doubt your child's sanity, to doubt the other person's sanity. Just listen. And I want you to remember that this is not a lifetime sentence on your child. Like a mastermind sent your child is a mastermind. I will be extremely annoyed if parents do that after, the, after these books come out. I will have to go around the country and be like, stop doing that. So it is really, it is imperative to remember this is a moment in time, it is not a lifetime sentence. And if you can hold your child accountable and figure out what's going on, this can be transformational as well. So when that happens, I also want you to go to your child and I want you to say something like, but, before you even say anything, no siblings can be around. None, no siblings. If you want to have a difficult conversation with your child and have any hope of success, you may not have it around the other siblings because the other siblings smell blood and then they go for it, 
right? So just don't do it. You're making your life way more, way difficult, way more than it needs to be if you do this with, like, you know, with kids around, other kids around. So say to your child, X was reported to me. Is that accurate? I want you to watch your child's body language. I want you to watch and listen to what your child says. If your child says, okay, maybe a little bit of it is, a little bit of it is accurate, your job as the parent is to say, well, that's that person's experience. You can't take away that person's experience, just like nobody can take that away from you. So that has to be honored, and that means that they've been hurt. That needs to be recognized and acknowledged. If your child says none of it was accurate, one of the things that I do with socially aggressive kids who are very focused on get, winning the debate is I say to them, if the other person was here and they were trying to convince me that you were wrong, what would they say? Because kids who love to debate will flip on the other side and be, it's amazing, they will debate the other side. <laughs> now, the, other, the thing that I would also, sort of my third bullet for you about these, about these issues of social dynamics with kids and being aggressive is that every, boys in particular are extremely concerned that if they come out and they talk about this, their lives will get worse. That's what they believe. I would ask you, as a parent, to say to your child, if they have had a moment of being aggressive, something like, what you've done, what you know specifically, is against my, our family values, here's the reasons why. I feel like, I hope that you've heard me about this and how seriously I take it. But I need you to be very, very clear about something with you. If the life of the target becomes more difficult as a result of our conversation, then you and I are on a whole different level of a problem. I'm gonna say it again. And the reason that this is so important is because your child could walk out of the conversation that they're having with you and text the bouncer and say, go after, the, go after that kid. So you're saying, I hear, I feel this, you know, what you've done, taking pictures of boob and saying boob boy is against our family values because it is humiliating that child specifically on something that he is insecure about. You are also using your phone to do that, which is absolutely against the values and the agreement that you made to have this incredible piece of technology that makes all of our lives better. So it is against what I stand for, fundamentally stand for in my bones as your parent. But if the life, and, I, you know, and I, I believe that you've heard me, I think that we've gotten to a good place. Let's just be clear. If the life of the target becomes more difficult as a result of this conversation, you and I are on a different level of a problem. You don't say that as like an ultimatum of like, you better not, you are just stating the facts. That is what's gonna happen. So you need to make a choice about what you need to do. Because what we have to do is really, as parents, specifically address the issue of when you feel that you have the right to have revenge, that that moment, like you can feel this moment, absolutely, but to act on it is against what this family stands for, and I will hold you accountable as a result. Those moments for children are very clear about what their parents stand for. And what is concerning to me is that we oftentimes resort, because parenting is complicated and people, it's really difficult to get to the concrete of this, is that we rely on sound bites, like do the right thing. Respect others the way you would respect, you know, treat people the way you would want to be treated. Life is way more complicated than that, and it always has been. So we have to be clear what our family values are and mine are, and what I'm asking you all to think about is that the dignity of every person is not negotiable. And I will actively enforce the values that I feel so strongly in your life. That is what I stand for. So now what I've given you is an overview of how we look at boys, some of their social dynamics, some of the conflicts, some of the roles in w that they play. What I want to end with before we go to Q&A is this. For mothers and fathers, this was, a ch for me as a mother, it was a challenging book to write. 
I want to say to the moms in the room that our sons can love us and they can cherish us and they can care for us. What they must do is respect us. They must. And what that means is moms, I think sometimes what I've heard from the boys, and I can see it in my own experience, that the legacy that many women have that they don't want to say or stand their ground when they are angry or frustrated because they are afraid that if they do, they will lose the relationship. And these relationships are our life. They are our heart. We cherish these boys. And these boys move away from us, and they are good at pushing our buttons, and we feel, we feel that the relationship is fracturing. And so when there is a moment of anger and frustration, we sometimes do not advocate our position seriously because we are afraid we will lose the, friend, the relationship that we have with this boy. I am 100% clear after these two years, after 20 years of teaching and two years of talking to the boys, if you want your son to disengage from you, don't hold your own. If you are able to hold your own, if you're able to laugh and say, yeah, uh-huh, you're still doing that. You're still, I am still your mother. I am still going to demand respect. If you treat him with dignity, but absolutely, absolutely demand that you are treated with dignity as well, your son will come forward. And for dads in the room, one of the things that I would, base, I'm, the word that comes to mind is beg, begging you to do, is that the boys really reported that they, many of them had wonderful dads. They knew their dads were wonderful. They loved their fathers. They wanted to have more deeper relationships with their dads. And even the most well-meaning dads were often not having conversations about relationships with their sons and the complexities of their friendships. The dads were not, have, did not talk about being betrayed by a friend or the first time that you had a crush and you, like, all you wanted to do was just stare at her, but you just couldn't because your face would blotch and then your friends would know and they would tease you and it was just, you were dying inside. The first time someone broke your heart, there are opportunities to talk to your son about your emotional life. One of the things that we do way too often in this culture, and I'm worried that dads are buying into this, and please, like, stop, don't, not, I don't think you're buying into it, I just think we're not talking about it, is that boys, are not simple. And dads need to rise up and say, my boy is not simple. He's not a sex-crazed, hormone, stupid guy who doesn't really think through things. He's not a lazy slacker. He is a boy who has co a complex life, just like I did, and I'm going to honor that in him. I'm going to see it in him. I'm going to acknowledge it. When we do that, the boys feel like they can express themselves and be the men and take the, make the mistakes or try things out in the right ways. But the other issue is, is that for the men, is that when we don't have these conversations, there seems to be always at least one or two guys, men, who, where, that are hanging out with the high school boys, the fathers of a guy in a group, who is having a very difficult time maintaining his boundaries and tries very hard to be 18 years old. And he says inappropriate things to the boys about the girls that go to the school. He says sex, sexist things. He says thing, he is, an, uh, honestly, the boys have talked to me a lot about this, this guy, this father, trying to be in with them. And the boys don't want it. Certainly the son doesn't want it, and, it's, and the other boys feel badly for the kid who does have this, son, this dad. But in the absence of all of these good conversations that we should be having, that conversation stands out. So the boys feel like there's an absence and a silence. They want the relationships with the men in their lives to be rich. So in closing, I want you to think about your questions because this is a conversation. But you matter in the life of a boy. Every single person does just like you do with the lives of girls. So I'm going to ask you tonight, at some point when you leave here, how do you, in a concrete way, see the boy in your life in a different way? That you look to him and acknowledge his life and say that you're going to be with him together. So thank you.